Back, Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program former U.S. Representative for North Carolina's 13th Congressional District, serving from 2003 to 2013, and um, uh, writing in the fall 2019 uh, uh, this uh, the American prospect, the 40 year war, Williams Barr's long struggle against congressional oversight. Uh, welcome to the program, Brad. Thank you. Glad to be with you. Um, I have to tell you that um, in addition to um, uh, being, uh, you know, uh, some of this being reliving uh, some of my youth in terms of uh, of your piece. Um, the thing that really struck me and, and we'll get into it in more detail, but I just have to say off uh, off the top is the Office of Legal Counsel, I did not have a sense of how um, how messed powerful. up of an yeah how powerful. Well, I and did have sinister. a sense of how powerful, but but how <laughs> like like so easy it is to corrupt it uh, yeah. in yeah. some ways. But let's uh, before we get there, maybe we're, I'm getting ahead of myself. But um, you write that William Barr. Um, this has been uh, part of, and he is part of, a 40-year project to essentially strengthen the power of the president. I imagine that's been an ongoing uh, battle since um, since day one on some level, but there's been we, we've entered into a new era of it. We, we have, and, and I think for, for Trump, it's, you know, it's obviously not doctrinal. Um, it's entirely opportunistic. He, I mean, he doesn't think about constitutional architecture, which is the uh, the phrase that uh, uh, constitutional scholars use for separation of powers and checks and balances. Um, it is an, it is entirely in his interest at the moment. Uh, so he thinks about it as much about as much as my dog thinks about whether to lick his own penis. Right. It, it serves his immediate needs. What to think about? Um, but for Barr and for others on the right, uh, there has been a consistent uh, plan, a consistent effort over the last 40 years at least uh, to create a very powerful executive and a very weak, well, really both the courts and Congress uh, lose power to the president under their interpretation um, and, and their, their preferred constitution, their preferred political system, their uh, gov- uh, system of government, uh, but especially Congress, especially Congress. Well, let, I want to I want to dig into the, the various examples over the course of these 40 years um, that you talk about. But I I am I, I mean, I and, and I and I felt sort of mystified and I knew I knew vaguely about uh, Bill Barr in his involvement um back in the uh, Iran Contra days. But right. when that 16 page memo of his that he wrote uh, saying that that uh, Trump was 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 really incapable of being um, investigated or at least uh, right. held to account because he was president. I mean, since that time, I've been sort of baffled about here's a guy who's retired. Who is it? I mean, is it where is this doctrine come from? I mean, like, where does is is he part of some type of like secret Straussian cult? I mean, what like, <laughs> like honestly, like I, I just like wonder. Like I I don't understand that type of of belief set. Right. Yeah, I, and I don't think they all get together in secret and perform rituals. Um, but there is almost a cult like belief in in a strong executive, and it, and um, it, it really. The, the line between the very strong executive elected by the people and strongman rule is really a pretty blurry line. Uh, and the, the, the idea of democracy, that, that government uh, derives its just powers from the consent of the governed, is really a, was a radical idea uh, back then in the 18th century, and it's still a radical idea. And not everyone accepts it. It is a radical idea of the left, not of the right. Um, people should remember that, um, you know, originally uh, senators were not popularly elected and, no. and, 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 and so on. I, I, it's... And actually, neither were presidents. Um, I mean, they fully expected the, elect, the Electoral College to be a deliberative body. They didn't, did not think it was logistically possible to elect presidents by popular vote because there's no way in the world someone from Georgia would know anything about someone from New York. Right. 
I mean, I and, and, and on some level, like that makes sense to me in terms of like a certain practicality. It's just hard for me to imagine that there are, there are, and there are um, yep. people who feel like the best thing for America is for us to have a, you know, quasi dictator type of yeah. situation. A man on horseback, yes. Um, but those people exist, so we got to take them at their word. Let's. Um, Let's go. Um, let's go back. I mean, you 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 cite um, through you know some early history ranging from uh, George Washington's first term to uh, Woodrow Wilson saying that informing uh, the the informing function of Congress should be preferred even to its legislative uh, function. In yeah. other words, um, you know uh, things like oversight and um, and whatnot. Um, and really, this turn really happened under the Reagan administration. Um, lay out for us, like, you know, how, how it was that Reagan assembled these people. But but it really goes back, I mean, before this, right, uh, where, where Dick Cheney sort of, uh, I guess, learned this concept under Nixon. Right. Yeah, it, it goes back to the Nixon administration. And, um, yeah, you know, Nixonian has become... Uh, a term used for extreme pres- claims of presidential power. Uh, and after Watergate, there were reforms, important reforms. Uh, the uh, Inspector General statute, which is what has led us to the Ukraine scandal and the possibility now of uh, the very real possibility of impeachment, uh, was a post-Watergate reform. So was the special counsel law. There were a lot of, uh, there, were, there were several important reforms that were designed to rein in the imperial presidency. Uh, and for Barr and for Edwin Meese and for others who were part of that group of, of, of rightist lawyers who came into the Reagan administration, both in the White House and in the Department of, of Justice, there was a sense that the Watergate reforms had gone far, had gone way too far, uh, and, and that pop, the just powers, the proper powers of the presidency needed to be reformed, need, needed to be restored. But in fact, they went much beyond that. Uh, you know, Edwin Meese gave speeches uh, that suggested that the president could disregard opinions of the Supreme Court with which he disagreed, uh, that, um, that independent agencies were an intrusion on the president's power over the executive branch, despite Supreme Court cases saying that uh, executive branch, um, uh, excuse me, independent agencies within the executive branch were perfectly okay. Um, and, and that was sort of where this began was with the Reagan administration, and they began picking fights uh, that they did not that, that went badly for them at first. All right. Well, let's. I mean, let's. Yeah, let's talk about those those fights um, because the first one was a function of executive privilege. Now, yeah, where did I mean this concept of executive privilege? Did this come out of case law? I mean, where 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 does this derive? Because, you know, it uh, over the course of 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 the inquiries into Donald Trump, we've seen a lot of 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 times where the executive does not seem to be calling for executive privilege, but those working for him cite it, even though it has not been initiated, I guess, they just right. sort of like think uh, they shouldn't talk about it. Um, we, just give us a little background on executive privilege, and then we'll, we we can go into the, the attempt by the EPA to withhold documents from Congress yeah. uh, back in the early 80s. It's pretty ill-defined. Uh, presidents uh, in the 20th century, I think Franklin Roosevelt and Dwight Eisenhower, uh, both said uh, that they would instruct uh, employees, uh, officials of the executive branch, not to answer certain questions that went to their uh, communications with the president. Um, that the confidentiality of communications with the president, so the president could make decisions with the best advice, because the advice was uninhibited. I mean, that's been around for a while. It it has not really been recognized by the courts until the Watergate cases and the Nixon administration, I guess one in particular. And it's never really really been very well defined. But but uh, the courts acknowledge that there probably are some communications between some high-level officials and the president uh, that should be regarded as privileged. Uh, but even that is uh, is subject to being overridden if there is a, a an obvious need for the information. 
Uh, and they do, in, in, in my experience as an oversight subcommittee chair for four years, uh, the executive does just throw that out there anytime they want, don't want to answer uh, a question. But, but uh, early on in the Reagan administration, there was a scandal that came out of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. The head then was uh, Ann Gorsuch Burford. Yes, she is Neil Gorsuch's mother, mm. or was. Um, and she was head of it, and it was a, a question about the Superfund, uh, the legislation to clean up uh, waste sites, uh, particularly contaminated waste sites. Uh, and there was a question about whether there was corruption and how that program was being administered and the funds were being spent. And uh, a couple, three House committees uh, got whistleblower information uh, and issued subpoenas, and the, and the Reagan administration folks at the White House and the DOJ told her not to provide the information but to assert uh, executive privilege. Uh, and then they had litigation over that, and the court said, this is not the time to raise this. The time to raise this is when she is um, defending uh, the criminal charges for contempt of Congress. Uh, and she said, what? <laughs> uh, what? Was this about criminal charges? Uh, and she just folded, and uh, they lost that battle. They lost it pretty, um, uh, pretty resoundingly, and Congress got all the documents um, the person under Gorsuch, who, who her name was Rita Lavelle, uh, who was head of the Superfund program, ended up being con- she ended up being fired, uh, then convicted of perjury, and she served an active active prison prison sentence for um, for perjury for what she had said to Congress. Um, uh, and then and then they, uh, the House, the Judiciary Committee, opened an investigation into how the Department of Justice had handled. Uh, their investigation and whether they had obstructed the the Department of Justice had obstructed the House investigation, uh, and whether high officials in the Department of Justice had committed perjury in in fighting the investigation. Uh, so things just kind of unraveled for the Reagan administration in their attempt in their attempt to put Congress in in their place at the time. Well, I mean, you know, the idea of someone lying to Congress and going to uh, to jail for it. The idea of Congress investigating the Department of Justice, those things seem so far removed from where we are today, because, you know, what you're outlining is like a, I feel like this happened, all this stuff happened like, I don't know, two years ago uh, under, under this president, right? I mean, we have the EPA refusing to hand over documents. It feels like every couple of weeks Um, we have... We have, I mean, we, we've seen people just in their nomination uh, hearings lie uh, yeah. to Congress. I mean, yeah. but, but yet we have none of those. I mean, we're, well, I mean, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but these tools seem to have g- gone away. Well, I've, you know, I've, I've wondered about that. Um, why is it so different now that they can just thumb their nose at Congress, um, just flout Congress's uh, oversight powers? And, and, you know, this... My article in American Prospect was written before the whole Ukraine stuff hit, um, but every every day are new examples of, of what I wrote about um, in the American Prospect piece. I, I think one important thing that has changed, in addition just the change in the norms and how tribal the partisanship is now, and how much negative partisanship there is because I don't you know I don't necessarily like my guys, but I hate your guys. Um, is the is that the special counsel law? Uh, enacted after Watergate, sunset uh, at the end of the Clinton administration, the beginning of the George W. Bush administration, uh, because Democrats by that point hated it because of how many investigations right. there had been under Clinton, and the Republicans had always hated it. Um, it, it had been what had um, brought the Iran Contra stuff um, to, the, to light and it made it impossible for the Bush administration, the George H. W. Bush administration, to make that go away. And the old law had a hair trigger requirement uh, to report upon demand by Congress, um, at least, a report uh, any evidence of, of possible criminal misconduct by executive branch officials to the District of Columbia Federal Court um, to appoint a special prosecutor so the special prosecutor would, would investigate and perhaps prosecute because of a possible conflict of interest. That's expired. 
And, then, and to be clear, that was the independent counsel law. We yes, can still have special counsels, but those are yes. appointed by the Department of Justice, like we had with right. Robert Mueller. Sorry, okay, yes, it, it, it was called an independent counsel law. That's correct. And they were appointed by the by the court itself. Um, the Department of Justice had to provide them resources, but they acted independently uh, with all the powers of the Department of the Department of Justice, and that expired. And um, you know, in the Ann Gorsuch Burford uh, matter, um, the Department of Justice said we don't have to prosecute her. I mean, the statute says that it, we have to, but we don't have to. It's an inherent power of the president to prosecute or not. But the, but there was sitting out there that independent counsel law, and Congress could have required the court to appoint a special prosecutor, an, an independent counsel, uh, to proceed or not. Um, and that's expired. And I think since then, and certainly what is happening now, uh, everyone involved know, involves, knows there's no way in the world the Department of Justice, the Bar Department of Justice, is going to bring anybody, is, not, is going to file a complaint for, against anybody for ignoring a subpoena from any committee of Congress except one maybe headed by Lindsey Graham. Um, and so they don't worry, they don't, they aren't worried about criminal prosecution. Nobody's worried about going to jail. And so they thumb their nose at Congress. You can't send us to jail. You can't do anything to us. Screw you. And we should say that back in, um, I guess it was in 88, um, the, um, the, or in, 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 in the, uh, I should say uh, prior to that, but just in that era you're talking about, uh, the, um, Congress had basically raised, floated the idea of an appointment of independent counsel for possible yeah. criminal charges against Ted Olson. Yes. Who was... Well, not, not, and just floated it. They had, in fact, done it. And, and, a, and the, the D.C. court had appointed a special uh, a independent counsel. Um, and Olson, and th- they were just spoiling for the fight. Uh, Olson and the others, uh, the other rightists in the administration, they were spoiling for the chance to challenge the constitutionality of the independent counsel law, because from their point of view, just every syllable of the law was an intrusion on the president's constitutional powers. Um, and they uh, they moved to quash the subpoena uh, that had been issued to Ted Olson and to declare the independent counsel law unconstitutional. It went to the Supreme Court, and they got their asses handed to them. Uh, it was a seven to one decision. I think when I think Kennedy had just been appointed to the court and he didn't participate, but it was by Rehnquist. And Rehnquist said, no problem here. There's a, uh, an inherent conflict of interest. And looking back at the, uh, the history of the Constitutional Convention, they were uh, the delegates and uh, those others at the time were um, uh, uh, did not want that strong a president an unchecked president, and they did uh, want there to be, um, uh, even if, if circumstances suggested there was a reason for it, uh, inter, inter-branch appointments so that Congress could appoint people who would serve in the executive branch, which just, to the, to the Reaganites, to the rightist in the in administration, was just apostasy. Uh, I mean, they got clobbered, and the only, the only one who voted with them, uh, went with them, was uh, Scalia. So, okay, so th- this sets the table. Obviously, the, the Democrats uh, allowed this law to lapse because yep. uh, in the wake of, um, of, of the Clinton uh, years. Yeah, um, well, not, and it was a Ken Starr thing, but it's not just that. Like, everybody in the administration at some point had a special counsel and, ran, and racked up tens or maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars of, uh, of attorney's fees in defending it, uh, um, in defending the investigations, and, and a lot of them had very badly damaged reputations. Uh, and there was a sense that it, it had gone too far, but they went from there to nothing. Right. The baby uh, was thrown out of the bathwater because, and let's talk about the OLC here, because I didn't realize what? that Rehnquist... Um, you said Barr followed Rehnquist, Scalia, and Olson as the head of the yeah. OLC. Wait, yeah. all of them were on the head of the yeah. OLC? They were yeah. all heads of the yeah. OLC at one point. That's it's... just <laughs> nuts to me. I yeah. mean, it really, because I guess I have had just a, you know, uh, obviously, um, uh, John, uh, uh, you, um, in the uh, Bush administration um, with, um, with, the torture, with torture memos, memos and, and, right. and, 
that to me was, I guess, was always framed by the media at the time as sort of um, a, a, an aberration that it was like, a, yeah. you know, that it was um, a, a one off. And it, and, it, and it seems like once the special counsel or I should say the independent counsel law um, sunsets, the OLC just becomes completely ri- ripe for some type of corruption because there's no way to hold anybody to account if the OLC and the DOJ essentially do not see themselves as an independent watchdog of the president. Correct. And even even after an administration changes, uh, it would be very, very difficult to bring a criminal prosecution against someone who disobeyed the law uh, during the previous administration if there was an OLC, Office of Legal Counsel, opinion saying that you were doing the right thing, that the, that the statute that you were ignoring uh, is unconstitutional, so you should do what the president tells you, and it's a, essentially a get-out-of-jail-free card. Uh, it's, it's, it's like a prospective pardon for conduct that has not yet been committed. Uh, and yes, the, the potential for abuse there is enormous, and yes, that, the pinch, that, that potential has been fully realized repeatedly for the last 30 years. Okay, well, let's talk, let's talk about um, where, what, what Barr's role in this. So after the uh, Reagan administration loses in all of their attempts, like what, um, and, and specifically um, the, um, the, the, the Rehnquist decision that you can have, um, you know, the, the independent counsel law is no problem, um, Barr then uh, sort of steps in at that point, and what does he do to sort of limit that? I mean, th- this is really sort of the beginning of the end on some level, even though yeah. we have to wait until after the Clinton administration to get rid of that law. Yeah, well, he became the first head of the OLC, the Office of Legal Counsel, in the uh, George H.W. Bush administration. Um, and less than a year after the decision on the, on the independent counsel law, Morrison v. Olson, he wrote an opinion as head of OLC, a memorandum that was distributed widely through the executive branch um, that said, uh, I think it's the name of it was 10 Common Incrus- Congressional Intrusions on Presidential Power, or something like that. Uh, but it was a very belligerent, militant memo that um, the that Congress, by statute, is intruding uh, on presidential power, and we need to be on the watch for it, and we need to resist it. And the way to resist it isn't by challenging it in court or by vetoing laws, which could be overridden by Congress. It is by simply uh, ignoring it. And um, really, all of the the language from that memo has continued to – even though that memo was supposedly pulled back in the Clinton administration – uh, that memo has become kind of the uh, the, the uh, touchstone for just about every claim of executive power by the right wing since then. I mean, isn't that claim basically um, you and what army? Pretty much, yeah. They can't do nothing about it, <laughs> so we can do what we want. Uh, I mean, it just it's. It's kind of uh, given a higher tone. Uh, it, it, sound, it sounds more principled, but, you know, that's basically it. Yeah, they can't challenge us. We're the ones who who enforce the laws, um, and they can say what they want, but we're not going to enforce the law against ourselves. And once once they pass their, pass their laws, they're done with it, and we decide what it means and whether to enforce it or not. So, I mean, let's let's skip ahead here to, to present day. Um, yeah. uh, once Barr introduces that uh, that concept and that and he introduces that concept even before the independent counsel uh, law is gone. So not yeah. only has he then established like we don't have to listen to anybody else. He, he what happens ultimately after the Clinton years and maybe I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm this is complete conjecture on my part, but I wonder if part of uh, this push to uh, sort of prove to the Democrats, like, you don't want this independent counsel law because we're going to abuse the heck out of it, um, was to get rid of it. Because at that point, then, there's no other vehicle. To yeah, ha- I think it was probably, that. well, that, that may be true, but it was also just 
opportunistic. They were trying to do damage, um, as Hillary Clinton's favorite, uh, famous phrase was, a vast right-wing conspiracy. Uh, they were seized upon, seizing upon anything that smelled um, slightly wrong and, and suggesting that, it was, it, there, that there was evidence of criminal wrongdoing and, and asked for a special counsel, and a great many were appointed. Um, but, you know, what the, uh, the Peace and American Prospect does lay out a lot of what the OLC opinions claimed in the George W. Bush administration when I think it was really being pushed by um, Cheney and, um, oh, who was the other, the, Ad, like Addison, Adder? Um, yes, Addison, yes. Addison, yeah. I mean, if you saw the movie Vice, um, I think those guys were just as sinister as they were portrayed in the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I and 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 you know, you get in a little bit into the attorney general um, firing scandal. I mean, this yeah. all has to do with the politicization of the Department of Justice. Right. But the, but the OLC, it, to me, the 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 corrupting of that process, I think, is is the most problematic because there's this. Yeah. And people should understand the Office of Legal Counsel. Just to be clear. It basically functions as the DOJ's in-house Supreme Court, right? right. I mean, right. W- they decide, except for there's no, you know, there's no cert, uh, you know, uh, they don't have to grant cert, uh, cert and they don't have to, uh, you know, uh, it's just like, we have a question on the legality of doing this. Let's go down the hall and, um, and Bill will tell us at uh, OLC if, they, if we can do it or not. They'll write up a memo. They, they get together. They figure out, you know, theoretically what the legal argument is, but there's no way to question it. Right. Um, so it really doesn't matter how uh, flimsy it all is. And, and we, in fact, don't know what most opinions say because a very small percentage are published. I mean, um, this is yeah. a really messed up way of doing it. So let me ask right. you, I have two questions. I mean, one uh, is in the in the immediate term, um, where obviously laws that were passed by a Democratic Congress cannot be passed by, uh, would not be passed by a Republican Senate. What power does the Congress have? I mean, if they had the ability before to appoint an independent counsel, which could yeah. then put into uh, legal jeopardy, these various players who might say like, hey, I'm not going to jail for Donald Trump or whoever it is. They don't have that ability anymore. What ability do they have that you perceive them as not using? Is it just inherent contempt? No, I don't think so. Um, And and I promised uh, Dave Day and I'll write another piece for American Prospect on what I I think the reforms coming out of this ought to be that are are comparable to the uh, post-Watergate reforms. I think there, there's a Supreme Court case, and in fact a long tradition, um, and a recent uh, Ninth Circuit decision that says that courts have the inherent power to appoint a special prosecutor for contempt of court because contempt of court is so important to the court's ability to exert its own power uh, that they can't depend upon the president. So if they, if they turn it over to the executive branch and the executive branch says, no, we're not going to prosecute that, then the court can appoint an independent counsel to prosecute it for them. Uh, I think that, um, one, they ought to try that now. They ought to petition the court and say, look at this, this, this Supreme Court decision on contempt of court. The same thing should apply to contempt of Congress. Appoint a special process, uh, an independent counsel. Uh, but even if they don't do that or if they try that and they don't win, um, they ought to enact a statute, a, a narrower um, independent counsel statute for contempt of Congress, perjury before Congress, false statements to Congress, obstruction of congressional investigations, conspiracy to do any of that, um, because it's very clear that the executive branch uh, cannot be made to do that if they are willing to take the political consequences of not doing it, and which, of course, the, the Trump administration is doing. And the Trump administration is ignoring all congressional subpoenas. Um, and, and people who aren't even in, in the administration. There are these two Russians who were the guys who introduced Giuliani to Ukrainian officials who've been subpoenaed um, by, uh, for a congressional investigation. They said, nah, we're not, we're not going to give you documents. We're not going to show up. Uh, get the Department of Justice to prosecute us. Good luck with that. Um, right. And that... Um, you know, that's got to change, because until that changes, uh, Congress has effectively no oversight power. And I introduced legislation to do that a decade ago. Um, and on the OLC, 
um, Russ Feingold introduced in the Senate, and I introduced a companion bill, the same bill in the House, uh, that would have required, with certain narrow exceptions, um, opinions by the Office of Legal Counsel be published. So we could know what they're telling, uh, what they're saying their powers are, at the very least, so Congress can do something about it. Um, and I would go further now, and I would say that an opinion of the Office of Legal Counsel um, you cannot say that you relied upon that in a criminal prosecution, as a defense in a criminal prosecution. And that would greatly cut in, I think, to the abuses of the OLC law, the law of the OLC. Well, um... And, and, and uh, a set of House members, I should tell you who they are, is somewhat bipartisan. I can't remember who they are, but it's within the last two weeks, has introduced legislation very like what Russ Feingold and I introduced a decade ago. Interesting. And, and, and what of inherent contempt? I mean, assuming that Congress doesn't pass anything in the short term, can uh, yeah. Nancy Pelosi say, all right, we're doing this. You, you know, you don't, um, Mike Pompeo, you don't give us the documents. I'm sending the sergeant at arms to go out and put you in the Congress, uh, the congressional uh, dungeon or whatever it is, yeah. or, or, <laughs> or we're just going to, you're going to rack up $2,000 a day in fines. And yeah. at one point, um, you, we're going to go to court and you can roll the dice because maybe in, in a year you're going to owe, you know, I don't know, the $300,000 or something. Yeah. Um, there's also legislation to do that, I think. Or, uh, I'm not sure it's been introduced, but there's an independent group, um, something like Good Government Now, I think is the name of it, it's proposed it, but with a limit of $25,000 for a civil fine, and that, that was part of the bill that I introduced a decade ago as well, um, to allow civil, civil fines. The problem with inherent contempt with executive branch officials is you're sending out the Capitol Police and the Sergeant of Arms to take somebody into custody who's got protection by law enforcement officers from the executive branch. And I really don't like the idea of a firefight, uh, an armed confrontation between the Capitol Police and and the FBI or this or the Secret Service. Uh, there's got to be a better way to do it than that. Um, but with respect to others who aren't in the executive branch, and, and, and both of them, by the way, would be assuming that they were taking orders, proper orders from above. Right. Um, the Capitol Police to take somebody in custody, the Secret Service not to allow someone to be taken into custody. Um, but with respect to others, um, I have suggested within the last year during this confrontation um, uh, that, like, the accounting firm, Lazar's, um, use inherent contempt a bit against them. And they haven't been saying they won't turn over stuff. I mean, they, the, the, the non-government officials are, are saying, yeah, you just, of course, just tell us what to do and we'll do it. We have got no interest in going to jail over this. Um, but it, it, there are problems, there are limits to inherent contempt. Obvi uh, there are obviously, and, and um, by the way, I thought Jerry Nadler got unfairly criticized for not doing more about Corey Lewandowski's um, testimony, where you know he was just a thug, um, thumbed his nose, uh, and th there isn't anything that's equivalent to a bench warrant. Uh, there was no way that that uh, Jerry could have said to the sergeant of arms, okay, go detain him until his attitude is improved, and then, and then we'll hear his testimony. Uh, there, there really isn't a way to do that. But there, there should be a way to get at, at least some uh, potential witnesses in a way that they have to worry about it. Yeah, well, I hope uh, at the very least what comes out of that is, um, uh, is, is some type of reform package for this that, um, yeah. that, that, that passes in, in Congress. Well, um, it's a fascinating piece, and uh, would love to have you back on when you do write that piece for the American Prospect on the solutions. Um, former Representative Brad Miller, the piece is Thank the 40 year war uh, in uh, the American Prospect. We'll put a link to that at majority.fm. Thanks so much again for your time. All right. Thanks, Sam. All right.